Welcome to this session on uh, the global macroeconomy, um, which uh, we at ORF are happy uh, to co-present um, with the UK High Commission. And there's the a very specific purpose to this session. Um, and it is in, in the broader context of, uh, of the think tank forum. And that is that as we prepare um, for creating an Indian narrative for our presidency for the G20, we have to recognize that through our own engagements outside with think tanks elsewhere, we will be able to anticipate uh, the possibilities of consensus. And it's all very well to create an Indian narrative. It doesn't go anywhere. Uh, the idea is to create an Indian narrative that at the G20, that produces consensus. And we have attempted, um, you know, in the, over the past six or eight months, to reach out to some of our existing partners in various parts of the world, and um, in this case, uh, the United Kingdom, to try and understand how under some of the heads that are priorities for the, uh, for the Indian government, um, in the G20 process, we could possibly uh, find ways, for, ways together, uh, forward together. So I encourage you, uh, all of you, to look at the three policy briefs that we published for this, uh, for this occasion in particular. Um, and I, I, you know, I'm, there are three of them. One is on uh, digital futures, one is on sustainable finance, and one is on the global macroeconomy. And I'm not going to talk in detail about any of them. Um, I will just explain why these, have, uh, these particular subjects have been chosen. All of you have heard already uh, about the importance of digital platforms and uh, the interlinkages between uh, what was earlier the digital economy and the real economy and how, it, how much it matters to the Indian development story and to India's plans for the G20, which is why we, we produce something on digital futures, a lot of which I think the, the shared norms, uh, guidebook, guidebooks and best practices, and expansion of the agenda. These are ideas that we heard today, and these are ideas that are explored at some length in this brief. Um, we have a brief on sustainable finance, which again we talked about earlier in the context of climate, but this is exactly how um, the climate discussion is made palatable um, you know, to the hard-headed uh, uh, central bankers and finance ministers who think they own the G20. All right, and let's face it, uh, the Sherpa track people is where all the ideas are. Then the finance track people come in and they say, great ideas, guys, let's go, let's go back to talking about finance. And they think they own it. This is where we put our, uh, the, uh, our ideas for investment and climate in. It's through sustainable finance. Again, uh, very useful. This is done in partnership with ODI in, in, in London, with the Overseas Development Institute in London. And again, thanks to... Uh, uh, um, the UK, uh, the British High Commission, putting us in touch with them. And finally, um, uh, uh, one on leveraging the global macro uh, uh, macroeconomic environment for recovery. And this was actually something that the uh, Ministry of Finance asked us for specifically, which is that uh, we are going through a period of, of macroeconomic instability. Um, can you reach out and find out uh, what are the ways in which the world thinks uh, we can transform macroecon macroeconomic uncertainty into the right conditions for recovery. And those ideas are in the third brief. And I'm not going to take up any further time. I'm going to move straight to our panel, um, who will uh, follow my wonderful example and be as brief as possible. Um, and I'm going to start by asking them uh, to talk about certain specific things. So um, um, Anna Schottpolt is joining us from the High Commission. And Anna, could you tell us a little bit about uh, what you think these briefs uh, provide and where, you where do you see the ideas are for possible consensus going forward? Hello? You can hear me. Great. Hi. Um, thank you, um, Mahir. Thank you for inviting me here today. Um, my name's Anna Schottbolt. I'm the um, newly arrived Deputy Trade Commissioner for um, Trade, Economics and Exports. Um, and this is a great uh, welcome for me to um, be around this table with you all and um, my fellow panelists to hear more about how we can make the most of um, India's G G20 presidency. Um, it obviously comes at a really important time for um, for the the globe. We're facing a number of economic um, challenges, including food and energy security, persistent inflation, slowing growth, and obviously the long-term issues around digitization of the economy and climate change. So it's never been more important for us all to be um, collaborating together, and that's why I'm really delighted that we're here today um, to, to launch these three um, reports, which um, here has just explained that we've worked together. 
with um, ORF and um, ODI in, in the UK. And I was just going to say a couple of things how I think um, some of these subjects um, give us some food for thought around what um, we as the UK would like to work with India and the G20 um, over 2023. So first of all um, is the report on um, the global um, macroeconomy, and I'm sure um, you've all been here, if you've been here throughout the day, you'll have been discussing um, the, uh, the, the challenges to the, um, the global economy and the latest forecast looking quite gloomy and uncertain. We obviously have the um, illegal Russia war in Ukraine, rising inflation, slowdown in China which is creating lots of issues like volatile energy and commodity prices, worsening food security, and raising extreme poverty in emerging markets and development countries. And so I think um, India and G20 um, together have a really key role in mitigating those risks, particularly supporting vulnerable countries like we're seeing at the minute in Sri Lanka to, and to safeguard the global recovery after COVID-19. Um, we, as the UK, are quite proud of recently announcing £4 billion worth of new financing to the IMF Poverty Reduction and Resilience Toolkit, but that's we need to go further, we need to work together to, to make sure that the, um, the financial architect is, is architecture is strong enough to, to deal with these issues. Then moving on to the second report around sustainable finance, um, obviously the uncertainties in energy markets make our transition and our commitments around net zero more difficult, but they make them more urgent. And I think we really need to strengthen our resolve together um, to meet those net zero goals that we all agreed last year in Glasgow at COP26. And as the G20 president, India has a real opportunity to show thought leadership here to ensure that climate finance can be mobilized at scale to support emerging markets, that we can support them with their adaptation and mitigation ambition, including through things like just energy transition partnerships. And we also need to make sure as a collective that those strategies are inclusive to both developed and developing countries and support economic development. And then lastly, we have our report on digitalization of the economy. Um, and G20 will be critical in supporting and managing that and will bring a lot of benefits to some of the issues that I've just outlined. Um, again, India has a really important leadership role to play here, building on its experience, particularly around the digital payments infrastructure. And it will be important for the G20 to monitor and assess both the risks and opportunities of digital innovations, such as cryptocurrencies. So I've decided to just mention those three things. Obviously, there's lots more that um, we will need to do together um, as a G20 around the pandemic preparedness, implementation of the international tax agreement that was agreed by G20 last year. Um, but we really look forward as the UK to collaborating with India and more generally with the G20. I'm really looking forward to hearing more about your thoughts and ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and uh, there are lots of uh, um, ideas for discussion um, that have sort of emerged from that. Um, I'm going to turn to um, first to you, uh, Pooja. Uh, so Pooja Mehra um, has been working with ORF um, on some of these issues for some time. And I want to ask you very specifically about um, the macroeconomic environment that over the, next, over the past six months has been defined, of course, by the uncertainties caused by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And in our neighborhood, we've seen how those play out um, for developing countries. Um, could you give us a little sense about what you think is going to be on the agenda by the time um, India takes over? And what are the sort of things that, as we heard in the previous session, uh, whatever our plans may be, are likely to punch us in the face in a sort of Mike Tyson kind of way? What are, what, are the, what are the things that are likely to turn up and, you know, startle us? Um, the trend. Okay. Um, yeah, I think... Um, uh, hi, my name is Pooja. I'm an independent journalist. Uh, I think that it's important for us to realize that uh, um, six months from now, or uh, even before that, uh, the way uh, the global macro economy is turning uh, the dominant mood and the climate would be such that they will be all talk about uh, currency depreciations uh, with consequent results uh, on debt sustain sovereign debt, debt sustainability of 
uh, like Ila was saying yesterday, at least 100 low-income economies. Uh, and when we talk of debt sustainability, uh, it doesn't sound very glamorous, but I'm afraid, uh, as we are seeing in the case of Sri Lanka right now, it's often the difference between uh, whether a quarter of your population is going to get their next meal or not, uh, because you don't have enough foreign exchange in your reserves to import food, uh, food and fuel. And uh, a lot of these countries are completely dependent on imports, as we are seeing in the case of Sri Lanka. So not all cases may, not, may be as severe, uh, but many cases will be. Uh, and I think, if I'm not wrong, the IMF is already going to put out uh, a detailed report on all of this. So uh, we may not, in many ways, have a choice. Uh, you know, the global mood and climate would be such that the narrative would be about all of these economies needing help. Uh, the interesting point, uh, the interesting thing uh, now is that um, a lot of this debt, sovereign debt, in these low-income economies is uh, owed to China. And uh, uh, I was quite surprised to read in the Financial Times just three days ago that China, in fact, now eclipses the IMF and the World Bank as a source of development credit to low-income economies. And uh, uh, so with uh, the U.S. Federal Reserve most likely to keep increasing their interest rates. Currencies of all of these countries are going to depreciate, like we are seeing in Pakistan, like we are to an extent also seeing in India, although India is not vulnerable. Uh, and uh, so what that means is that, you know, the debt becomes even more expensive and even more difficult to pay back. And um, so when a lot of this debt is owed to China, you're going to have to restructure this debt and the global financial order does not have very good mechanisms to do that because uh, China is not a part of what is called the Paris Club, uh, uh, where the IMF and the World, uh, World Bank and uh, all of the large economies of the world sit and uh, decide how countries' um, debt has to be restructured or written off. And they're not willing to do it because they realize that if they were to provide assistance to these economies, that money would will be used by these economies to repay the debt to China. So effectively, what they will end up doing is they will end up subsidizing red debt repayment by these economies to China. So I suspect that the whole geopolitical, macroeconomic, global financial order narrative at that point in time will be dominated by these kind of concerns. And it will, as you said, uh, uh, you know, drag the entire conversation uh, uh, towards this uh, development. Um, yeah, so, so and, and, and spillovers is the other thing I think that, you know, spillovers, uh, this is actually one of the consequences when we say, say spillovers, this is one of the consequences of um, um, US uh, and uh, European monetary policy. Yes, and I think we may uh, come back to that if we have time, but uh, I definitely hear you that um, the, tw the various crises that have um, um, you know, had a cumulative effect on countries across the world and causing them to change their debt position um, are likely to be very high on the Indian agenda precisely because one of the instructions that has come down from, I think, the Prime Minister's office has been that India's presidency must take into account what non-G20 countries um, uh, uh, require out of the global financial system. And I think most importantly right now, it is a clear and transparent method for answering these questions about geopolitics uh, that are posed by the sovereign debt crisis. Um, thank you. I'm going to turn to you, um, uh, um, Shikha Basin. Shikha Basin is from CEEW and has also been working um, with all of us on, on G20 issues um, to ask, where do you think, if India were to prioritize certain aspects of, um, in the finance track in particular and in cooperation, where, where, where is it likely to get the best combination of consensus and traction? Okay, uh, thanks a lot, Mihir, and uh, thanks to ORF for having uh, all of us here talking about um, very interesting and agenda-setting issues. Um, in the face of so much volatility, right? I mean, at this point, a lot of it is anybody's guess, but um, you know, we I guess 
the only way we move forward is to try and at least start building consensus one room at a time. Um, and I think when we start thinking about the macroeconomic volatility, uh, you know, as Pooja has just alluded to, and then you ask me a question on where can we actually drive consensus, right? It actually takes me back to what Mansi said, that we can have an ambition, uh, and then we need to see what our ambition should look like so that we're poising ourselves for success. Uh, and if it's okay with you, I'd like to talk to both those points. Um, so I'm a climate researcher, and I think when we start thinking about um, the prevalence of the G20 vis-a-vis -vis the rules-based orders that exist around the world, um, we've got the structures in place for trade, uh, you know, for monetary policy, fiscal policy, so on and so forth. Um, the area of a global crisis which is absolutely not working today is that of climate change, right? You look at the UNFCCC and the efficacy of ambition there. There is not one single commitment or ambition that has been tabled by the developed part of the world that has been met. Whether that is in emissions reduction, whether that is in finance, whether that is in capacity building, or whether that's in technology cooperation, which used to be known as technology transfers. Um, given this reality, my wish would be that India takes on the ambition to really push hard for accountability to creep into the UNFCCC, right? There's a lot of rules in there, but none of those rules actually talk about being accountable to climate action. Now, that's my wish list. If I take that wish list and sort of um, think about it in a much more pragmatic manner of how can we push the sustainability agenda uh, in the reality of deepened energy insecurity, in the reality of inward-looking industrial policies making a comeback in a massive way, uh, in the reality of uh, upcoming recessions and current stagflations, um, I'm going to borrow a phrase that my organization used to put out a recovery uh, study for India um, when COVID had just struck. And they couched the study with NIPFP and called it Jobs, Growth, and Sustainability. Now, I think this is an agenda that we can at least try uh, to build a consensus on um, well outside of this room with other country partners. Um, can we look at net zero as an ambition that is not just thought of nationally, but at a sectoral level internationally, right? And that speaks to the global value chains uh, conversation that just happened earlier today. Um, can we look at technology partnerships as a form of cooperation that focuses, in fact, on cleaner transitions and not just the clean tech sectors, right? We need to take care of um, drivers of our economy that are here to stay realistically, at least for the next 20 years. Um, so I think if we really try and think about it from uh, a repurposed um, alignment uh, of a multipolar world that takes into account that, yes, there are severe economic constraints and energy constraints that we're all operating within, uh, and really couch it towards, you know, well, we need jobs, we need growth. You're not going to see uh, global growth without global trade, as Mr. Kant mentioned this morning. Um, but we also need these transitions to be sustainable. And um, perhaps this time of multivariate uh, crises is a time to think of reforming some of these structures. Thank you, Shikha. Um, and I'm going to turn now to Achilles Tilutia, who's the um, head of research and chief of staff at the National Infrastructure Investment Fund. Um, so neatly spanning the worlds of, of uh, thought and action. Um, and um, Achilles, you just heard that you know, without trade, no jobs. You know, um, but without investment, no jobs. Without investment, no sustainability. So um, as somebody who's on the front lines of asking about investment and infrastructure to the world, what is it that you feel that India's presidency of the G20 needs to provide for sustainable finance to work not just for us, but for the entire class of developing countries that we're hoping to be a voice for? Thank you. Thank you for uh, having me here also. Um, I think uh, quite a few points have been covered, but let me uh, make one observation and talk about three points from where uh, investments for the world need to get channelized and how we should be thinking about it. Um, I was uh, listening to how Pooja was thinking about it from six months hence, and one interesting thing that would have happened by December or so 
is uh, the U.S. Uh, Senate elections would have been behind us, and the China uh, transition, if any, would be behind us. There would be some very interesting geopolitical developments that would have taken place, uh, and we would have some more information. Uh, we would have also seen uh, how the G20 meetings in Indonesia progress. Uh, so between now and then, a lot of um, geopolitical moves would have happened, which have uh, not the topic of this uh, conversation, but I think which will have very important bearing on how the macroeconomic conversations happen when uh, the entire set of countries begin to come together. The three set of points that I want to talk about, uh, and uh, uh, indeed as Shikha mentioned, the big issue that I think can unite us all uh, in a room of uh, 20 countries which have very, very divergent uh, uh, viewpoints on many issues, uh, including the rules-based order, for example, uh, is the whole issue of climate. Uh, this is a shared human challenge, in a sense, and it's a pretty long-term challenge that uh, we all need to work together about. Uh, we look at it in uh, four dimensions when we think about uh, how we think about green uh, from an investment perspective. And um, the first and a very critical one and something which has uh, been in news uh, recently is the sustainability of getting the right set of materials that will be required for green transition. And that's uh, thankfully been a lot more in the news in terms of uh, where global alliances are beginning to get, how the distribution of these materials will be, uh, and security of uh, various countries in accessing those materials is going to be an important composition uh, component of uh, the green uh, transition. The second is uh, technology in terms of transfers and or collaborations. Uh, Again, as we think about India's green ambitions, uh, there are a lot of new technologies that will need to become part of India's either energy mix or transport mix, etc. Uh, we've been working actively on uh, things like hyd green hydrogen, offshore wind, etc., some of them which may not be viable uh, from an India economic cost point. How do we think about those technologies either being localized, which can hopefully also reduce costs and create jobs, uh, but also how do we make that work at uh, price points that are viable for Global South specifically. Uh, the third is in terms of building capacity, just ensuring that uh, what uh, is available uh, as technology is also put together uh, in the local overall ecosystem. Otherwise, again, the dependency of, with respect to technologies for most of these countries will come through. And finally, uh, money, uh, the finance point, and again, uh, the point that Shikha mentioned that uh, some of the commitments need to be honored. We've been working on the idea of uh, building a network of green financial institutions across the world. How do you source and pool capital, create the right sort of instruments, create the right sort of uh, risk mitigation mechanisms, but still bring in uh, capital which can make all the changes in green. So uh, to sum up for the first point, uh, green is an important component uh, that we need to potentially uh, champion as uh, India in, as part of its G20. Uh, and this is not just an India or a developing world issue, this is a common humanity issue. The second point is about macroeconomic stability. And I think uh, the point about debt sustainability came about uh, and inflation as well as food security all have been spoken about here. There has to be some amount of agreement to say how this debt will be made sustainable. Uh, there were times when, again, some of these currency swaps between countries had to be put in place so that you give the market some amount of confidence that countries uh, will be in a position to honor their debts. Is that a time that is not done bilaterally, but at a more multilateral level, uh, such that there is more confidence in countries is something that needs to be thought about. Uh, a lot of this inflation that we are seeing now is uh, rather commodity-based, and hence the free flow of trade is going to be an important one. Fracturing of trade uh, has become an important challenge, uh, whether it is because of war or because of sanctions, and how can we move beyond that and ensure that there is a free flow of trade which can help subside this inflation is going to be an important uh, public good sort of a discussion between all countries that we need to think about. And finally, the last point, again, coming from an investment perspective, uh, the fracturing of the financial architecture that in some sense has been hinted at, uh, again, hasn't quite impacted the capital flow across the world currently, especially for countries like India. Uh, but that's something that uh, I think, again, as a public good, uh, we should try and see how the world can protect so that there is no sudden surprises with either respect to capital inflows or outflows. Uh, and. Uh, uh, and countries don't need to suddenly scramble to figure out where their own reserves are kept, etc. So three points, green, macro stability, and uh, financial architecture, I think, uh, could be areas of uh, interest for the global world for India to take up. Thank you. 
Thanks, Akilesh. And I think that um, those three points are exactly on. I'm going to um, throw open um, uh, two questions from the floor in just a second. But before that, I want to take one more round and even briefer than, um, than the last one. And I'm going to take a page from, a, from you know, Jarnel's questions earlier, earlier today to ask um, if you had, um, and let's focus this on, 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 the, on, the treasure, on, on the finance track rather than on the Sherpa track. If you had one thing that you wanted to put at the top of the finance track agenda, what would that be? And I'm going to run, run down uh, uh, this, this row again. So, Anna, one, just one. I think um, listening to, to this, I think it's the, the kind of the food security creating prices, like making sure that prices are not inflating so that we can um, make sure that poverty is not okay. increasing. So that link between commodity price inflation, food security, and so on. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think since we've still not been able to agree globally on the notion of uh, what constitutes climate finance, I think a general agreement on what would constitute sustainable finance, right? And it could allude to the three points that Akhilesh mentioned, but I think a consensus on what is sustainable finance. So norms on, what, on sustainable finance, finding at least a basis for discussion of, those, what, of how you could exchange those norms. Um, I mean, a commitment would be great, but at least a basis. Always great, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess uh, it, it'll be spillovers, uh, probably, I don't know, I'm not so sure. But I would like it to be spillovers. So the, okay, yeah. Because so I think that pretty much de uh, decides everything so else. Spillovers from, from monetary action in, in the, in the, which I think you're right, is going to be pretty crucial for uh, macro, for recovery in the rest of the world. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, who debt is owned, for instance, do I have a minute? Uh, for instance, if debt is owed to China, then what was collateralized? That, that, then, you know, if it is the Hamantota port, hmm. then ha that has geopolitical implications. If it was some mines of uh, rare minerals, which is going to determine your, determine your green agenda, you know, so everything is just interlinked and everything is sort of uh, cascading. <laughs> um, Akhilesh. I'll take the genie uh, option out and I'll put all of these three things as my wish list. Uh, <laughs> but uh, on a more serious note, I think, again, coming in from an investment perspective, uh, if we can get the climate uh, agreements, both in terms of how we think about either taxonomy, what counts as sustainable, etc., I think that can create a new series of uh, fund flows that happen across the world, uh, hopefully a new set of growth drivers that come through. Uh, so if between the three I have to choose, I will choose that as something that comes up. Right. I have been told that we have to f try and finish the session a, a little early because we are running behind time. But are there any questions um, from the audience um, that I should take? Otherwise, I have another set that I want to go with. Um, for, first you, and then we'll move to Nea. Thank you. I'm Anissa Shigliano. I am a fellow at Global Policy Insight. I mainly have a question for Anna Schottbolt. So it was very, I was actually very glad to hear that uh, things like uh, food poverty are in the agenda for the UK, and especially when it comes to the support to India uh, ahead of and throughout uh, the G20. But I also had some concerns because obviously the recent policies in the UK are made of cuts. So 0.7 went down to 0.5. Uh, the, for, for example, for the Global Partnership for Education, the target was not met. There is also a question around the Global Fund for Malaria, Tuberculosis and HIV. So obviously now we are talking about trade and what can be done in that sense, but I was wondering what are your opinions probably on what can be done effectively, keeping into consideration inflation, crisis in the UK, uh, rather than just ideals. Thank you. Right, we'll, we'll take a couple of others and, and then we'll come to you. Uh, yeah. No, uh, you're not on. Done. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you, Meher. Um, so as somebody mentioned that everything is interlinked, uh, so I'm just going to pose my question or a comment from the morning session and to this session. Um, uh, Shika, you, I think, rightly mentioned that things have to be seen in the context of war as well as the inflation and probably, you know, imminent recession that we are looking at. 
and what does that mean in terms of compacts that we have to agree, uh, we might have to agree in terms of easing the flow of finance from north to the south, really. Uh, they, these compacts, by, by sorry, compacts sorry. we mean... flow of finance from? North, north to, to south. the yeah, south. Okay. So uh, we will have interest rates rising, we will have uh, emerging economy currencies depreciating. It's a question for everyone. Uh, then how do we actually combine public finance and private finance and enter into probably regional compacts or even bilateral compacts between G20 nations where certain kind of uh, you know, uh, attention is given and acknowledged that with these shocks, longer term structural transformations would also require financial flows and what would what could those compacts look like? Would they be in, you know, you mentioned de-risking instruments, etc. But the point that I'm trying to make is they will need to be much more concrete uh, in both form and action, which we haven't seen, you know, so that's one. Uh, second is taking the same kind of theory to see that what Indonesia did probably just could not manage to do enough on finance. Uh, what can India do which can be carried on forward to Brazil, and there I think uh, some sectoral attention, especially uh, you know to agriculture because these are important sectors, uh, economic sectors for the for the next presidency also, and to the topic of adaptation, you know. So it is it is really uh, you know an opportunity for India to lay sort of a blueprint for developing countries uh, on adaptation and on certain sect sectoral priorities for uh, finance to flow so-called uh, sustainable and green finance to flow. Uh, somewhere it has the opportunity also to demonstrate. So in terms of sustainable finance definitions, et cetera, we are already part of International Forum for Sustainable Finance. We are working on taxonomy. So there is also what you can demonstrate, which is domestically happening, which could be a blueprint for other emerging economies. So any thoughts on that? Uh, concrete ideas? Great, thanks. Um, and I think we'll come back uh, maybe for another round, but. Um, I'll turn to the panel for, the, for their answers, yeah. In whatever order you want to go. Anna, you can go first. Hi, thank you for your um, question. I think um, you know, the UK is still, comparably to other G7 countries, really committed to spending um, a proportion of GDP on overseas development. And a lot of the work we've been doing this year has been focused on supporting um, the crisis in Ukraine, as I mentioned, we'd committed this four billion to the IMF. So I think we're we're still we're still committed, and we want to work with partners like India, particularly through the G20, of how we can work together to kind of improve the impact of that that money through multilateral, through IMF, and through bilaterally. So we're definitely still committed. Uh, thanks, Neha. I think you might actually be able to answer your question better than me, but I'll try and take a crack at it. Um, I think on the compacts, um, if we start looking, and I mentioned this in my intervention already, right? Uh, I think if we start looking at net zero as also being a, a clear ambition or a pledge that's at least been tabled, right? And you start looking at companies and global value chains and how certain countries fit in with each other uh, along that line and actually commit to something within the compact. I think that's one easier, slightly easier way to do it. Uh, a second one, if I go back to also the findings um, of the value chain study that got released earlier this afternoon, right? Um, look at more direct free trade agreements and like bilateral partnerships. And I think if we can tweak these existing commitments or these forthcoming commitments that we have nationally, uh, you know, in a region or across borders, um, and actually start quantifying what that might mean in terms of emissions reduction, we'll find ourselves in the race to zero a lot quicker um, than what we see is happening today. Um, and I think on the Indonesia point of what is it that we're taking forward, I mean, I think climate finance, sustainability finance has been an issue area for a while within the finance track, and the finance group is doing a lot of work on it. Um, so I think moving forward on the taxonomy, but also looking at the global um, climate compounding effects that we're all seeing, right? So whether that's heat stress, whether that's, uh, you know, 
mortality and productivity losses resulting out of natural disasters, so on and so forth. Um, and then couching that in the language of sustainable finance, because today there's like real economic losses that countries who are all a part of the G20 grouping are suffering. Um, so I think using that from Indonesia and taking it forward um, you know, in, in our presidency might be an idea. Uh, I'll just link the idea of net zero to an idea that we talk about of net financing by countries. So uh, it's very easy to talk about commitments on net zero. Countries go about committing it. They are so long-ended and subject to so many technology changes, etc., etc. We don't know how and when this will happen. But one of the key components is where is the finance going to come in from? There are various numbers floating around, for example, even for India in terms of hundreds of billions to trillions of dollars that need to be done. Uh, of course, a lot of this will be done locally, but is there commitment that is coming in specifically, specifically with granular clarity in terms of, okay, if there is global flow of finance, where is it going to come in from? Are countries committing to it? If you were to extend that thought somewhat more further, uh, somewhat in the more wishful realm, but uh, this receiving of finance for the global south, in a sense, is an asset for them. Uh, and this asset is something that banks, financial institutions, developmental world, uh, developmental banks, etc., could, in some sense, securitize right up front, give you all that cash flow up front so that you can begin to invest in that technology if the developing world had the certainty that money flow will take place from the developed world. So in a sense, the net zero commitments of the developing world have to be balanced with the net financing commitments of the developed world. And it is somewhat of a one-legged stool, literally, to have just net zero commitments of countries. They will potentially come to net zero uh, at the end of it if you don't have financing. So. Uh, I think if we can balance these two together uh, and begin to build on the architecture of how this uh, future fund flows can be put into place now, I think they end up solving a lot of issues with respect to jobs and growth also in the immediate term. So some thoughts to think about. And I think we heard that from um, the uh, G20 coordinator, the former foreign secretary yesterday, when he said very clearly that one of the priorities is the global green deal. Um, which ensures that some of the logic behind the domestic green deals are extended um, on, on a global level in such a way that you know everyone benefits, uh, the private sector globally benefits, the uh, savers and finances, finance globally benefits, but so does the green tra transition and the growth stories of, of, of much of the world.